Timothy, we're going to be in chapter 4 tonight, and let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and as always, a few moments of silence, and then I'll close this out, so let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together and to study your word. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide what I have to say, and I thank you, Lord, for what your word is going to teach us tonight. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we ended last time in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and if you remember, the three verses we ended on were verses 14, 15, and 16 of chapter 3, and we discovered that those three verses uh, switched gears from the first part of chapter 3, which was talking about leadership, and then of course those last three verses, he uh, changes gears and talks about authority. And the authority that he mentions is, first of all, in verse 14, the Word of God. Verse 15, the second authority is the uh, teaching of the Word of God. And then finally, verse 16, the third authority is the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why he talks about authority is because in chapter 4, he's going to start talking about apostasy. Uh, He's he's letting Timothy know uh, that apostasy is going to come into the church. Uh, And this apostasy will not, it'll come from the outside, but it will manifest itself on the inside of the church. Now, 1 Timothy was written about 64 AD, which is only a short 31 years after after the ascension of Christ. And in that span of time, in that 31 years, Satan was in the process process of, uh, and was actually about to establish a beachhead, if you will, of false teaching within the church itself. Um, and that's what Acts chapter 4, is, or uh, 1 Timothy 4 is about. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29, Paul says this. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And of course, the savage wolves he refers to would be the false teachers who would come into the congregations of the churches all over the regions, the ones that he had established, the ones that Peter and John and all the other apostles had established, and this, this, these, this, uh, this false teaching would come in and begin to manifest itself. Uh, and soon, of course, we know that in context, the apostles will all be gone, uh, so it will be up to the pastor teachers of the churches of the body of Christ to carry the colors forward. Uh, The greatest responsibility for the pastor is to study and teach the Word of God. Nothing comes before that. But in regard to 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, I love to find quotes from from authors and from famous people, and I really love quotes that are ancient. I love finding quotes from people that were alive 2,000 years ago or more. And one of them was a guy named Sun Tzu. Uh, In 500 B.C., he wrote The Art of War. Sun Tzu was a Chinese general, and he was also a philosopher. And many of the quotes from that book serve as illustrations, or can serve as illustrations of spiritual truth. And so one of those quotes that kind of applies to what we have tonight is this. If he says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy... For every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Point is, know your enemy. Okay. Uh, so Paul is telling Timothy to know the enemy, but also to know himself. So for pastors, since Timothy's the one being addressed, knowing yourself means knowing your mission. And of course, the mission for the pastor teacher is to study and teach the Word of God. The mission is to recognize as well apostasy and to speak out against it. Knowing the enemy means knowing his ambush tactics, his, his, uh, his traps, his snares, and especially his counterfeit doctrines that are going to come into the church. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to spend most of our time tonight in the first two verses. Verse 1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. 
men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared, uh, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Okay, once again, do, do you, I, w- I was raised in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and I remember in the early 70s on Saturday mornings when we were watching cartoons, they would have this, uh, this really catchy little thing that would come on between the cartoons that would teach you about English. I don't know if you, does anybody remember conjunction, junction, what's your function? Does anybody remember that? Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that, that's back in the days on, when, when they made learning English fun, right? Because it was really cool. And so we got to learn about conjunctions. And of course, a conjunction is something that is very important when it comes to the English language. And the conjunction we have, or the first word we have in verse 1 is but. And but is a conjunction. And so he's going to contrast something. But is a conjunction of contrast. And so what he's going to do in contrast to what he said in the last three verses of chapter 3, talking about authority, uh, there is the opposite of the word of God, which is apostasy. And he says, but the Spirit explicitly says. And of course, since the definite article, the word the, is in front of the word Spirit, it means the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit explicitly says, in other words, the Spirit's about to say something, and since Paul wrote these words and he was inspired by the Spirit, then we need to listen to what the Spirit is about to say. And so he says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times. Now, what does that refer to? Does that refer to a, uh, the last days of the church age, or does it refer to something else? Well, what it refers to is a time that is future to the writer. Since he wrote this in 64 AD, then it was the later times would be times that came after that, if you will. So this, in later times in verse 1, is not a reference to the last days of the church age. The last days of the church age are referenced in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, which says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. So the wording in the Greek is different. Later times of 1 Timothy 4.1 is a time that is future, whereas last days of 2 Timothy 3.1 is the last days of the church age. So Paul pens these words, and in other words, after he writes these things, apostasy will enter the church. And if it is not stopped, it will cause chaos and destruction. So he says that in later times, this means that every generation between the first and the second advents of Christ will be subjected to apostasy. That's what he means. When he says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, in your mind, think about every generation of people that have been born thus far in the the times, you know, over the past 2,000 years, all the way up to the second advent of Christ, apostasy will come along and attack that generation. That's what he means there. Uh, And of course, that means that, uh, you know, every generation needs to remember the Word of God. I was listening to Philip DeCourcy today on the radio. He's one of the pastors I like to listen to. And he was talking about the fact that the book of Deuteronomy, was that, that was the second time that the law had been written. And the reason why is because the people of Israel needed to be reminded about the word, about the law of God. You see, one generation hears the word and they take in the word and they believe, and then the next generation after that, they just fall away. And that's what happened throughout Israel's history. And this is why it's so very important for us today in the times in which we live is we need to always remember the truth, always have the gospel before us uh, so that we will not fall off the apple card, if you will. But he says, he goes on to say in verse 1, some will fall away from the faith. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. Now the some refers to believers in the body of Christ. And to fall away means to come under the influence of evil. From the faith, by the way, does not refer to saving faith In other words, you can't lose your salvation. 
All right? But it refers to the wording, the, the word in the Greek for faith, it refers to what is believed, in other words, the word of God. So that some believers in later times in every generation will fall away from or come under the influence of uh, uh, evil instead of being under the influence of the word of God. So the Holy, or the Holy Spirit expressly states that in every generation there will be believers who will fall away and come under the influence of evil. They will be saved, but they will be apostate. And this is precisely what the writer of Hebrews means. In Hebrews chapter 2, we studied it, where he writes of the drifting away from the faith. You remember that? He, Hebrews 2.1, For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. You see, and that's what he's talking about here. Paul says that it's going to happen. It's going to happen in every generation. So we need to be aware of it. If the Bible warns us, we need to be taking note. An expanded translation of what we have thus far in this verse goes like this. But that same Holy Spirit who vindicated the incarnate Christ explicitly reports that in later periods of time between the advents of Christ, some believers will become apostate. They will revolt against the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19 spells that out. So the believer who rejects doctrine inevitably falls into apostasy. Now, the question is, how will this apostasy manifest itself? Well, he tells us in the rest of the verse. He says, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That phrase, paying attention to, means to apply the mind to a thing, to concentrate on something, to adhere to something, to be occupied with something, to pay attention to something. You get the idea that people are being engrossed in whatever it is, they're being sucked into it. The believer who drifts away from doctrine, from the Word of God, at some point begins to pay attention to, to be occupied with something else. And if it's not the Word of God, then it's going to be evil, guaranteed. Ephesians 4.17 says this, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. That word futility in Ephesians 4.17 is the Greek word matiotes, and it means vanity, a vacuum in the soul. See, here's the deal. If a Christian, if a believer gets away from the Word of God, if they drift away and, and, and the Word of God is no longer important to them, there's going to come a point to where the Word of God is basically, they're, they're going to forget, right? Because we need to remember. And if they forget, and they're going to get farther and farther away from it, Satan's looking for an opportunity to weasel his way in there and bring evil into the soul and make that person apostate. They're still saved, but they're living in misery. And that's what he's talking about here. And so, instead of the Word of God in that person's life, we have deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, deceitful spirits refers to fallen angels who communicate satanic doctrine and act as Satan's teachers of the dissemination of the policy of evil. Satanic policies of evil are called doctrines of demons. And Satan's primary weapon against the believer is false doctrine. How do we know this? Two great examples. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, when he was tempted by the devil, the devil tried to twist what the word of God said. And then in the Garden of Eden, what did he do? He convinced Eve that what God said about the tree was not what he really meant. You see, in both instances, he took the words of God and he tried to twist them into something that they weren't. You see, the fact of the matter is, Satan has false pastors who promote his evil agenda and evil political leaders who promote his agenda. Believer and unbeliever alike 
become blind to the truth. Liberalism in the church and in government is false doctrine promoted by fallen angels under the direction of Satan. Liberalism in the church and in government promotes groupthink, facilitators, and communist policies. These policies are presented as good when in reality they lead to the slavery of the masses. Since eternity past, Satan has been on a power trip which has not been satiated in the least. Now I want to give you, I'm going to give you two examples tonight. One is an example of satanic deception in the church. I've talked about this before, but it's worth talking about again. Chris Lom. C H R I S. Can you hear me? Yep, there it is. Chris Lom. Definition. This is according to CARM.org, C-A-R-M.org. Chrislam is an attempt to blend Christian and Islamic principles and practices into a single unifying theological perspective. It began in the 1970s in Lagos, Nigeria, in part to lessen the tensions between Christians and Muslims. The idea has spread throughout the world and has taken root here in America. The main principle of Chrislam is to work with what is common between Christianity and Islam. Therefore, in Chrislam, both the Bible and the Quran are recognized as equal holy books. And they affirm that both religions worship the same God. That's called doctrines of demons, folks. Okay? There's a very large church in California run by a very famous pastor who has embraced Chrislam. I know it for a fact. I'm not going to say his name. You probably already know. According to gospelnetwork.org, uh, it says, uh, the, the headline is, See the first images of construction progress on Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi of the One World Religion headquarters. The names of the three Chrislam houses of worship have been revealed as Imam al Tayyib Mosque, St. Francis Church, and Moses bin Maimon Synagogue. So you got the Muslims, you got the Christians, and you got the Jews. The project, which also includes a culture center, will welcome visitors to worship, learn, and engage in dialogue. A fifth of the project is now complete, officials said, and it is due to open in 2022. The project is a legacy of Pope Francis's visit to Abu Dhabi in February of 2019. Its design was unveiled by Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, at a meeting of the Higher Committee of Human Fraternity in New York. Construction work is well underway on the Chrislam Abrahamic, Abrahamic Family House, Abu Dhabi's multi-faith place of worship. New images show the foundations of the church, mosque, and synagogue being built on uh, Sadayet Island. That's an example right there, a modern-day example of doctrines of demons, folks, mixing the Christian faith with Islamic faith, with, with Islamic religion. This is what we're talking about. This is what Paul was talking about 2,000 years ago, that some believers are going to fall off the apple cart and they're going to start embracing this stuff. If you have your Bibles, or if you want to just listen, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're just going to look at two verses real quick. Verses 20 and 21. He says, no, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. 
You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Now this tells us a couple of things. The Gentiles and that he's talking about, he's, he's talking about the pagan, uh, like the temple of Diana, for example, was real popular in Corinth. That was a pagan temple. There was prostitutes there, and they, and they offered sacrifices, and they, and they had a, 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 a food and all these things. And, of course, the, excuse me, the food that they offered, they were offering it literally to demons. Okay? And so what Paul is saying, the believer cannot be demon-possessed, okay? Cannot be demon-possessed, but the believer can fellowship with demons. People who engage in Chrislam are fellowshipping with demons. It's that simple. The believer in fellowship with demons will not be in fellowship with the Lord. It's impossible. That's what verse 21 tells us. Okay? So I just wanted to take you to those two verses just to show you that, there, that it is possible for demons to be present amongst believers. One example, I told you, I'd give you another example. One example of satanic deception in government is communism. Any form of government whose end goal is the enslavement of the masses to the government is evil and not of God. This enslavement is couched in good-sounding language. For example, have you heard this from the government or from other sources? We know what's best for you. We want to help you. Here's a free cell phone. Move to the city and we will provide for you. We'll pay for your college debt. All that's doctrines of demons, folks, because it goes against the word of God. It all sounds good, but it's deception designed to enslave people to the whim of a dictator or an oligarchy or some combination of both. The super wealthy elite globalists today simply want to rule over you. Okay? Okay? Doctrines of demons. You see, it comes in all forms. It's not just within the church. It's within our world. It's everywhere. I want to take you to one more passage of Scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians this time, um, chapter 11. And we'll look at three verses there. In these verses, Paul is going to list, well, not in these verses. He's going to talk about characteristics of false teachers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 through 15. He says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds." couple of things. First of all, in verse 13, Paul lists three characteristics of false teachers. First of all, they have a false authority. They call themselves apostles, but their authority, their authority is not from God. It is false, and it comes from Satan. In the church today, think of those in great power who are in authority, and then see if they line up with Scripture. His title begins with a P, by the way. Yeah, that's a great example. His title begins with a P. Finish the rest. Great authority, right? Might have made some people mad, but I don't really care. Second characteristic of false teachers is a false message. Deceitful workers, in verse 13, in the Greek, means fraudulent artisans. Okay? They paint a false picture and convince people that it's the truth. The third characteristic in verse 13 is a false identity. The word disguising in the Greek means masquerade. They call themselves teachers and servants of God, but it's all a masquerade. It's all fake. A false costume. A mask they put on to accomplish their false agenda. Of course, in verse 14, we see the power behind false teachers and the mask that they wear, and that's Satan himself. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, light illuminates. And in context, the light spoken of here refers to the message of the false teachers. The message of the false teacher is doctrines of demons. Satanic false doctrine. It appears to come from God, but it's false. 
And Satan has always wanted to be like God, so he uses counterfeit and deception to convince people that what he says is the truth. Like a fake Rembrandt painting or a counterfeit money, so is the deception of Satan. The painting looks real to the untrained eye, but it's fake. The money looks real, like real money, but of course, it's fake. So also, doctrines of demons may look good and appear right, but up on closer inspection, it's false. False teachers are emissaries of Satan. Believers who drift away from the truth are in grave danger of drifting into the camp of the enemy and becoming apostate. That's what he's telling us in our, in our, in our passage. And then finally, in verse 15, it says, Therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. The corollary here is obvious. If Satan is the master of masquerading the truth, then the false teachers will do the same. They will claim to speak righteousness, but it's all fake and it's not from God. I want to give you a couple of points about Satan and the angel of light. Actually, there's four of them. We know from Scripture that Satan wanted to be like God. God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Since Satan desired to be like him, we can infer that he also wants to create and sustain, but he cannot. Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, the five I wills of Satan. He says, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Therefore, Satan desires to be like God. The second one, and this, I want you to think about this for a little bit. Satanic doctrine wants to improve the environment. Now, what do I mean by that? Since he is the temporary ruler of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and since he cannot create and sustain, he will try to emulate or masquerade that effort. So he desires to improve the environment. Number three, satanic doctrine versus Bible doctrine. Satan says improve the environment. The Bible says change the souls of people in the devil's world. Free their souls from the cosmos through salvation in Christ. It is the soul that is saved, not the environment. Then give them the word of God so that they can enjoy their freedom from the devil's world. These, let's think about this. These saved souls then demonstrate to billions of angels, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You see that? Finally, the scope of the devil's world. This includes the entire concept of human good. Human good rejects the grace of God and substitutes human ability, human energy, human norms, human standards for divine provision. Catherine was telling me about an article she read in the Epic Times this past week. Apparently, scientists who are so concerned about global warming and so concerned about storms have done something to make the storms worse. I forget what it was. The pollution reduction has actually opened up the gate for, worse, for stronger hurricanes. Imagine that. See, that, see, that, see, that's human energy against God's energy against divine provision. One of the current issues in the world today, again, is global warming improving the environment, is it not? Climate change is, is up there at the top two, right? Since the big push around the world promotes improving the environment, and since Satan currently rules this world, and we can call global warming, climate change, improving the environment, Chrislam, socialism, communism, fascism, globalism, feed the world, doctrines of demons because it all falls under a false pretense. Anything that is promoted and believed outside of biblical truth falls under doctrines of demons. There is no gray area here, folks. It's simply light or darkness, truth or lies. The believer who falls for these doctrines of demons has embraced apostasy and believed the lie. Verse 2, he says, By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience, uh, with a branding iron. The word hypocrite or hypocrisy, in the Greek, it described an actor with a mask. In Greek plays, 
Oftentimes, you know, they had the mask where you, you, attached to the little stick, and they'd hold it up in front of their face, and, and so the, the actor was portraying somebody he was not. He was called a hypocrite, okay? And that's exactly what it is. Um, the, these, same, the, these false teachers who teach what they teach, uh, this apostasy, they're hypocrites. And the word liars in verse 2 means a pathological liar, lying as a way of life. I can't help but lie because that's who I am. That's who these people are, okay? In verse 1, we saw the angelic source of apostasy, right? Doctrines of demons. In verse 2, we have the human source of apostasy. They are called hypocritical, pathological liars. These, li the, these pathological liars are the human agents of Satan. In the church, they lead believers into reversionism and unbelievers into doctrines of demons. Of course, believers can fall under the influence of doctrines of demons of, as well. We could call these human agents apostasies or um, apostles of apostasy. We could call them that. Anyone who teaches Chrislam, by the way, in any church anywhere is an apost apostle of apostasy. They exist in every category of the human race, from the richest to the poorest, they're present, they're everywhere. Now, who are some pathological liars in society today? Politicians, leaders in general, generals, General Mark Milley, remember him? Remember all that? Mark Milley accusing uh, Trump of, uh, of Russia collusion and it was proved to be a lie, okay? Um, admirals, judges, School teachers, college professors, psychologists, they can all be, I'm not saying they are, but they can all be apostles of apostasy. They have one thing in common. When they are in this category, they are under the influence of evil. They are emissaries of Satan. They are promoting doctrines of demons. Second part of verse 2 says, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. In those days, when a person had a slave, one of the things he could do, if he chose to, and a lot of them did, they would take a branding iron and they would they'd, they'd, uh, sear the slave on the forehead, put some kind of a mark, like so now that that slave belongs to him. And so uh, the searing of the conscience is a metaphor of the branding of slaves on their foreheads. As the slave was branded on the flesh and thereby owned by his master, so also the agents of apostasy are seared in their conscience and become slaves to doctrines of demons. The searing of the conscience is the deadening of the conscience. Golly day, have we not seen some people in, in, in the news today that have no conscience whatsoever, right? The more these pathological liars lie, the more they become numb to the lies they speak. So in verses 1 and 2, doctrines of demons, the angelic part of it, Apostles of apostasy, the human part of it. All this stuff is going to invade the church, is what Paul's telling this local congregation, and of course us as well. Now in verses 3 through 5, especially in verse 3, Paul gets to the specific apostasy that was plaguing the Ephesian church. The ascetics, asceticism, they were the forerunners of the Gnostics. Ascetics and Gnostics both taught that matter is evil, that only the spirit is good, so that that chair is evil, this podium is evil. Uh, since I'm made of material stuff, I'm evil. That, that's the way they thought. Um, and so he says in verse 3, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. These guys were agents of apostasy, apostasy who said that marriage is bad as well as certain foods. They're bad because they're material. Engaging in the normal marriage relationship and eating uh, food was evil. These two things were physical of the material universe. If a person did not engage in marriage and eat only the foods that they said they could eat, that person was saved. That was what they were saying. Don't get married and only eat what we tell you to eat. If you do that, man, you're saved. Apostasy. Agents of apostasy. That was their message. In response, he says in verse 3, um, abstaining from certain foods which God has created to be gratefully shared 
uh, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. God created sex and marriage. God created all the food on the planet. It's okay and perfect, uh, perfect in His plan to engage in these things. Those who believe and know this truth will see the lie of the ascetic agent of apostasy. That's what he's telling us in verse 3. Remember what Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Anybody with any little, you know, even a little bit of doctrinal truth in their minds at this time, in context, they would have seen right through this ascetic garbage. And they would have known that, you know what, that's wrong, that's false. I'm not going to believe that. But apparently some in the Ephesian church were having this problem. And so Paul is telling Timothy, look, dude, this is the deal. You, you got to straighten this out because these people are getting, they're, they're, they're starting to get out there, okay? And then, of course, in verses 4 and 5, he says, verse 4, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected it is a, uh, if, if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Everything created by God is good. The marriage relationship is good. Food is good. The key is to be thankful for and to, be, and to sanctify uh, that it is set apart to God by the Word of God and prayer. In other words, we thank God through prayer. It comes from God. We set it apart to God. We realize that it comes from Him. That includes our marriage, by the way. Our marriage should be sanctified, set, a, set apart to God. In closing, I want to give you a description of our world today and then the solution. Tell me if this does not sound like our world today. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. God wrote that, or Isaiah wrote that not long before, excuse me, the uh, Babylonian captivity. Uh, so the hammer was about to fall. It sounds like our world today. But to end on a good note, what did Jesus say? John 16, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So Christ has already overcome doctrines of demons. But we as believers, especially in the days in which we live, need to be very aware of what's going on. Uh, be very, uh, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, gentle as dove, but wise as serpents. That's the, that's the idea. That's the way we should live our lives when it comes to our faith. Okay, we'll pick up next time at verse 6, and he'll, where he'll, we'll, he will go on to talk more about defenses, defenses against these dangers that we see all around us. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, I pray uh, that the provision of your word has, has, uh, has made impact tonight. Lord, if we just opened our eyes, we, we see these doctrines of demons everywhere, everywhere we look. But Father, help us to remember that you have indeed overcome the world, that your son Jesus Christ has overcome the world and that when we put him first in our lives and make him the priority in our lives and, and make the word of God uh, real and make it a part of our everyday, uh, Father, we're going to be okay no matter what. I thank you for that provision and I pray that you be with each of us as we go our separate ways. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.